Please, uh, please begin. You want me to read until page? I'm in the 101. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm in the okay. Yeah, I would uh, go through and do the um, go do the hundred syllable mantra, and then go to page twelve, which is the Sagari Mati requested sutra. Okay. So, I mean, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank prayers. Altruistic motivation. Devla, Dangor, JP, Drop, Nopar, Jepa, G, Tapa, Dangham, Jaykin, Amar, Do, Chopar, Jepa, Tamche, Kiso, Jepa, Banam, Kanam, Namha, Sanchen, Tamche, Dewa, Dangan, Dugnal, Dangdril, Gordu, Lagna, Mepa, Yang, Dag, Parzo, Paching, Chu, Rinpoche, Tul, Barja. All mothers and two things, especially those enemies who hate me, instructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles in my path of liberation on missions, may they experience happiness, be separated from me. Suffering and simply, I will establish them in a state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mothers and two things, especially those enemies who hate me, instructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles in my past liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness to be separated from suffering. Swiftly, I will establish them in a state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Action Buddha to the prayer. Dechi, Dechi, Dusong, Magi, Kikar, Du, Kunan, Isung, Gela, Lako, Mashi, Bardu, Bana, Isung, Gela, Lako, to the great soul Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until the start of tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Long refuge prayer. Zara, do you have a way of turning up your microphone because you're very, you're quite faint. Okay. Is this better? Is this better? Okay. Long refuge prayer. Drenchen sawa dangu barji pe. Helden lama dampa damla kepsu chiyo. Yidam kilpur chila shogmatnam la. Kapsu Chiyo Sangi Chumben Denam La Kapsu Chiyo Dampa Chonam La Kapsu Chiyo Paglag Genun Nam La Kapsu Chiyo Pawa Kandro Chokong Sunlai Chok Yi Shiki Jendang Tenpa Nam La Kapsu Chiyo We take refuge in the kind root and lineage on this. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Dhirams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the Noba, noble Dhakas, Dakinis, Dharma guardians, possessors of the Eye of Wisdom. We take refuge in the kind, root, and lineage Lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas, mandalas of the Dhirams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble dhakas, dakinis, and dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Taking the bodhisattva bell. Ching chu ming poi chi ki va. Sanghi nam la kap su chi. Shi dang chen chu sen pa yi. Shi la yang de zhen kap su chi. Shi tar gong chi di ji pi. Chinchu to ni ki pa da, Chanchu sin pa la pa la, De da grip shen ni pa tai, De jen dro la pen don du, Chinchu sin ni ki ji jing, De jen du ni la pa la, Pen pa jen du la pa ji. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas, I take refuge in all the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattva. As the previous Buddhas embraced enlightened mind, 
and progress on the Bodhisattva's path, I too heard the benefit of all sentient beings give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas, I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assimilated Bodhisattva. As the previous Buddhas embrace the enlightened mind and progress on the Bodhisattva's path, I too heard the benefit of all sentient beings give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Short Refuge Prayer. Sanghi Chodang Sanghi Shu Namla Changchu Bardu Dagni Kepsu Chi Dagi Shen Subji Paso Namki Jola Penju Shir Sanghi Jodparjo. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, may I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. The Four Immeasurables. Manam Kadang Nam Pathe Simchen Amche Dewa Dang Wei Wei Di Dang Ben Pai Go Ji Na Dang Du Nam Di Di Dang Da Wo Jo Ji Di Dang Ma Pa Dewa Dang Ma Pa Wo Jo Ji Ne Ren Che Dang Ne Dang Pa Wo Dang Ma Ma Ne Pa Jo Ji May all some other sentient beings, balance of the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Hundred syllable purification mantra of Vajra or Sasaka. Do you want to say it in English or Tibetan? Say it once, please, in the English and then three times in the uh, Sanskrit. Okay. Om Vajrasattva Samaya. Help to protect my vow to purify myself. May you remain firm with me. Grant me the complete satisfaction. Grow with me, be loving towards me. Grant me the attainments to master the powers beyond body and nature. Show me all the deeds of body, speech, and mind. Make my heart, mind, good, virtuous, and auspicious. Reveal in the bliss of the four joys, O blessed one, who embodies the essence within me. Do not abandon me. Grant me the realizations of the indestructible nature. Make me one with you. Thus I signify my unity with the non-duality. Ah. Om Vajra Sattva Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sattva Tanupa Tishta Drido Me Baba Sutto Kyo Me Baba Sutto Kyo Me Baba Anu Rakto Me Baba Sarva Sita Me Prayasha Sarva Karma Sut Sami Satan Shari Kura Mang Ha 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 O Bhagawan Sarva Tagagata, Vajra Mami Munsa, Vajri Baba Mahaya Sama Sattva A, Om Vajra Sattva Samaya, Mana, Manu Palaya, Vajra Sattva Tanopa, Tishta Trido, Mi Baba, Sutta Kyo, Mi Baba, Supa Kyo, Mi Baba, Anurakto, Mi Baba, Sarva Sita, Mi Prayasha, Sarva Karma Sutta, Sami Satan Sharia Kurahog. Ha ha ha. Ha ho, Bhagawan. Sarva Tagarata, Vajra Mama Munsa, Vajra Baba Maya, Samaya Sattva. Ah. Sagar, sorry. Sagara Mita requested sutra. Tadayata Shama Shama Wati Shama Ita Satu. Am Purama Purama Rezita. Karata Ki Yori Sutso Wati Yami. 
Vishtuda. Dramali mala panayi. Kukuri ka ka grasi grasana. O muka param muka abuka sha mitwani. Sarva graha bandana ni ni gritva. Sarva para pra wadina vi mukta. Mara pasa sha vipa. Uda mudra anun gat tuta sarva mara puta rita para suda mika tasun ta santu sarva mara karmani. Likewise, be extinguished, extinguish all enemies to my purpose. Whatever evil forces are in me be defeated, do this, so that when I am victorious, all pure radiance melts into me, completely purified. Take all this knowledge, food and drink, peacefully enjoy it, and be satisfied. And, satis and be satisfied so that all obstacles may be destroyed. Be liberated from all obstacles and general obstacles. Maras are defeated by this, this gesture of the Buddha. By reciting this mantra, may all Maras be purified. As a result, may all Maras be defeated. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any feedback? Um, I think it would be good if you listen to the recording. Okay. I think that would be the best thing. All right. So um, tonight we're continuing our discussion on the Jewel Ornamental Liberation. So we are on uh, Chapter 7, and this is the antidote to the attachment of the uh, pleasure of peace. So the pleasure of peace, our attachment to desiring peace. So the, the what we use is loving kindness and compassion. So does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that we've talked about thus far, about the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma? We covered all that, I think. We talked about that, and uh, it would be good if you have time, you know, in your daily practice that you're reciting the opening prayers and that you're reciting the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma, and then applying the things that we discussed. In those, in those, uh, in those conversations. Okay. All right, so if there's no comments, then I'll keep on going. So the teachings on the practices of loving kindness and compassion are the remedy to being attached to the pleasure of peace. So I'm using the outline book from the uh, from the Jewelman Liberation. So I'm just really reading from that right now. I'll read this line once again. The teachings on the practices of loving kindness and compassion are the remedy to being attached to the pleasure of peace, pleasure of peace. So what does attached to the pleasure of peace mean? It is the desire to achieve nirvana only for one's self, without an altruistic mind for sentient beings. And because of that, because of it, one does not benefit others. This is called the lesser vehicle, otherwise known as the Hinayana. So when we are selfishly seeking our own liberation, seeking our own happiness, we are uh, we're not thinking about other beings, and we are seeking only our own peace, our own pleasure of peace. We're not thinking of it in terms of other beings. But if one develops loving kindness and compassion, then one is attached to sentient beings and dares not attain liberation only for oneself. Therefore, one should practice loving kindness and compassion. So this is the teaching of the Hinayana is very useful and is something that is quite necessary for us to develop a, um, a, a need to be able to discipline ourselves, to focus ourselves on being able to uh, 
bring the practices into our own heart and so on. However, the, the, uh, what happens is we develop an arrogance, we develop a selfishness that we are doing this for our own benefit and we're not thinking of other beings. So in order to uh, overcome that, we have the middle way teachings, which are the Mahayana teachings that the Buddha taught as well as the Hinayana teachings, the way of discipline. He taught the middle way teachings. And the hero of the middle way teachings is the Bodhisattva, the holy enlightened being. And the Bodhisattva has dedicated everything that the Bodhisattva does for the benefit of the enlightenment of other beings. So this safeguards against ego attachment. This safeguards against selfishness. This safeguards against arrogance. So, and we are practicing this for the benefit of others. So we use loving kindness and compassion as parts of what um, the bodhicitta is. We talk about bodhicitta, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So what we're doing is we're bringing this now to our attention and doing this for the benefit of others. So we've talked about this before when we were talking about the stages of meditation. We talk about that the stages of meditation has a method in which to be able to focus upon loving kindness and compassion. And we use the example, we use our mother as an example to do that. Now, it may not be our mother, it may be our father, it may be uh, an auntie or an uncle, it may be our grandmother or grandfather, it may be some figure in our life that raised us, that helped us uh, as an infant and uh, taught us right from wrong and fed us, cleaned us, did all the things that we needed to do as a young child to grow into a happy and healthy ch uh, person as we are now. So loving kindness is the, the mind that wants all sentient beings to meet with happiness. So this is loving kindness. We want the mind to be um, full of wisdom, full of happiness, and that there's a, uh, a logic to this. There's a method to this. There is a way to do this to be able to focus our minds because loving kindness may seem to be something that is a little bit subtle to us or something that's so easy, we, we take it for granted. But really, it's very, very fundamental. So we talk about in the Jewel Ornamental Liberation that there's three levels of loving kindness. There's three ways to look at loving kindness. So the first way is loving kindness uh, with sentient beings as an object, that everything that I'm doing is I'm doing it for the benefit of other beings, other sentient beings. And that's my object, that what I'm doing, what I'm developing is for their benefit. The second one is loving kindness with phenomena as, an, as its object. So it's looking beyond just human beings, but it's looking at all beings and it's looking at all phenomenal nature, all the, the trees, all the nature, all the stars, all the atmosphere, the earth and all the other planets and so on. Looking at everything that we consider to be nature, looking at that uh, with loving kindness. And then the next one is the non-objectified loving kindness, non-objectified. So this is um, having the, the mind of the Buddha, where it's not focused on any group of beings, any being on this planet. It's not focused on anything. It is just focused on, it, it is just accepting and becoming uh, all that is. It's becoming the space that holds all this, that all this is within the space. The phenomenal nature we can think of sometimes as being like a a, <clears throat> a huge bubble that is well within this space, and the space is is this 
um, unknowing, non-conceptual, non-dual essence of what we all come from. So loving kindness, going back to the beginning of this, loving kindness with sentient beings as its object is what we would call an ordinary bodhisattva uh, aspiration. That we, the you know, bodhisattva is the holy enlightened being, and we want to do this for the benefit of all beings. We want all all beings to to have loving kindness, to have this wisdom. We're willing to learn our own practices. We're willing to to uh, purify our own self, and uh, to be able to share that with other beings, uh, very simply, as an aspiration. The next one, the loving kindness with phenomena as its object, is this is the bodhisattva conduct that has the 10 virtues in mind. So we talked about the 10 virtues before as the, the, um, the three of the body, the four of the speech, and the three of the mind. So we um, need to be able to conduct ourselves with the utmost virtue. So this is a loving kindness practice. This is a wisdom practice. What we are becoming wise about, what we are learning about is what the causes of our non-virtues are and what the causes of our virtues are. So we're, we're learning how the logic works. We're learning how, what it is to, to be a bodhisattva, what it is to be a practitioner. We're learning about all the fundamentals of what all the Dharma teachings are, the fundamental aspects of them, and beginning to put them into some kind of a structure, some kind of a frame that we can repeat over and over again, and that we can utilize for the benefit of other beings in the way that we conduct ourselves with those human beings, but also to help them to recognize what it is that we're doing, to be able to teach them what the Buddha Dharma is. So this is based on the virtues, the virtuous activities of a holy enlightened one, of a practitioner, of a yogi or a yogini, of a, of a being who is on the path to becoming a Buddha. So this is with phenomena as its object. So this not only takes uh, the 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 object of other human beings, but it's also thinking about the earth. It's thinking about other things that we impact and they can impact us. So we begin to think of everything as being part of this uh, phenomenal nature. And we don't want to do harm to anything. We don't want to do harm to other beings. We don't want to do harm to the planet. We don't want to do harm to um, nature, the, the trees and the forests and the oceans and uh, the rivers and, and the land itself and so on. So we begin to think of this in a much broader sense and see it all as extensions of, of who we are, that we are all part of this phenomenal nature that we have a place in this, and this phenomenal nature has a place in us. We are all made up of the same materials and so on. So the virtues of, of being part of this is the loving kindness, is the, the wisdom that we are building up, this knowledge base of wisdom. The non-objectified loving kindness the non-objectified loving kindness that does not have a specific focus in mind is the bodhisattva path of the insight mind. The insight that this state of mind is, is open, is free, is liberated, is non-conceptual, is non-dual, is unelaborated, is non-objectifiable. So we're not thinking of anything in specific, but we're thinking just in generally, like the example of the sun that we use all the time, that is just radiating its light, radiating its heat for the benefit of all that receives it, with no intention of what it's doing, no expectation of what's coming back to it. 
So being able to uh, to have that non-objectifiable lo loving kindness. So this would be the same as as the Buddha, the the Buddha that is within ourselves, and all this is within ourselves. So the the Bodhisattva is conscious of the object, and the Buddha is not necessarily conscious of the object. Is doing it for the bet for for its own benefit for not thinking about what this is for. It is free, it is liberated. So this loving kindness builds up this body of wisdom, builds up this body of, of knowledge, knowledge of the self, knowledge of who we are, human beings, the way we act, the way reasons why we act this way, what the nature of things is like. We begin to understand uh, the concepts of emptiness, we begin to understand the concept of, of uh, purification. So we're doing all these things for the benefit of other beings. The, body, the Buddha is, this is just the nature of the Buddha. This is the essence of what this is. Of the Bodhisattva is an expression of that nature, of that essence, is an expression of that and come to has a, 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 a um, has a uh, an intellectual ability to be able to to look at this and to be able to discuss this to be able to think of this and so on the buddha on the other hand is totally free of of that now the buddha can be an emanation body who is talking to us who is teaching us this these things and so on and is doing that for our benefit is manifesting in a form that we can relate to ordinary human beings can relate to but the essence of what buddha is talking about and we have that essence within us is this total freedom so these are things that become apparent to us become real to us where we begin to recognize the more that we engage in these studies the more that we engage in the contemplations the more that we engage in the um, practices and the meditation, the, com the, the completion stage of the meditation, to be able to have those epiphanies, to be able to have those experiences of a clear mind, of an open mind and so on. So talking about it vicariously like this is just talking about a little bit about it. But once you have those experiences, then that never can be taken away from you and there's no doubt of what this means you begin to understand it from your own experience so this is of course what we're always talking about so i'd like to uh, have a little bit of a discussion we have a few people here so we can have a good discussion sometimes it's better when there's just a few people here we can have a, uh, a more heartfelt discussion with each other. Uh, so let's, in, in, uh, let's engage in that. So we need your participation to be able to do that. So give us some feedback, give us some experience with this. You've heard these things before, but maybe now the wheel has gone around a couple, three, four times, and you've heard this now several times over, so maybe it's starting, some synapses are starting to close in your mind. You're starting to have some associations with, with your own experience. So would somebody like to uh, be the first to speak? I have, a I have a question. So the Buddha and Bodhisattva, in relation to what you've just described to us, the Buddha is is just fluent in it. Is that maybe the literal delineation where the Bodhisattva is still having to think about loving kind actions of loving kindness, where the Buddha just does, doesn't have to think about it. That is just their nature. I think that's a good way of looking at it. Yes. The, the Bodhisattva is assembling all this, this knowledge and experience and so on, while the Buddha is that experience. Okay. Is it possible, okay, so like, for example, as I go about my day, and I, if I stop and think, why am I doing this? Or like, I have these thoughts and my ego comes in and says, oh, that's inconvenient or picking up that trash or doing, that is me being Bodhisattva, right? Like, be, like, that's the Bodhisattva part of me. However, if I didn't have those thoughts and just did, 
right? And not didn't have, that's the Buddha. That's my Buddha nature. That's within me. Is well, that, very generally, I, very generally speaking, yes. Okay. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to more for myself because I'm in the process of these synapses happening right now. Like as, as we speak, like right, the last couple of years have been really exponential for my spiritual growth. So I'm thinking about what you've just said in like in the last like two, two or three days for myself, right? Um, in my behaviors. So, so another you. characteristic of that, of that Buddha mind, of that Buddha behavior, the body, speech, and mind, is it's perfect. It's flawless. It does not make a mistake. It does not. It's perfectly stable. So there's no falling backwards. So we shouldn't confuse, uh, you know, our being in this, you know, on this pathway uh, that, that we're, we may have some glimpses of that, but we're certainly not stable now. We shouldn't allow ourselves to think that we that we are Buddha in that way, that we are stabilized in that. Unless you are. In that, case, in that case, then anything I say doesn't mean anything. I'm wondering, as we're having this conversation, Lance and you at any point can just direct me back onto the, the main highway because I may come off on an off ramp right now. Does anyone just feel sad about letting go of your ego? Like you're like, like <laughs> that's a well, good question. Well, it, it, is a, it is a good question because I was like, well, gosh darn it, I want someone to care about me. Or like, like <laughs> I keep asking myself, like, like I did something today. My sister was like, hey, I'm going to California. You know, my niece is turning seven. She wants to go to San Diego Spooktacular with you. Will you dress up in this unicorn outfit? Of course, I'm going to dress up in the unicorn outfit, Lance, with the, the seven-year-old child. Of course, I'm going to. Put those and pictures I, in the I, WhatsApp uh, chat, please. They will pictures. be in the WhatsApp chat for everyone's convenience. So I'm going to, of course, wear these outfits. And then it's, it's a two-hour drive. And then I, I, I wrote her a text message and I said, hey, like, I'm going to do all this flying, coming in and all this. And I said, I... And then I caught myself in the text. I said, I think this is like too much travel. And I feel like this is going to be like really chaotic. But then I realized, and I, and I, I realized it was for myself. I was, I was like, but I was saying it like for everybody, like getting in the car, picking me up. And then the seven-year-old wants to go to San Diego. And I'm like, I think this is too much, but it was really, I was wanting to say it's too much for me to like turn. And then I felt really selfish. And I was like, oh, this is, I should be kind and compassionate to my niece. She wants to do this with her aunt. And, and now I feel guilty because like I'm listening to this conversation and I'm like, oh crap. I, I mean, my ego came in and it was like a selfish thing to say. I don't want to, I don't know. I was just thinking about it from a very lay example. Well, that is a good case in point. Yeah. And if but, you remember, if you remember, you know, some months ago when we were talking about the stages of meditation and to help us to develop the awareness of loving kindness, we use the four kindnesses of the mother right. as an example. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the four yeah. kindnesses of the mother? You mean like to to give birth to us, like the pain of, of hold, like the the pain of having to hold us in the belly. Like there's there's four. I know there's four elements, and it's like the suffering and pain that of the mother goes through. Well, the sacrifices that she made. Yeah. And she and she did it. You know. Uh, happily, she did it, uh, you know, uh, so unselfishly in order to bring a, a human being into to life. In its purest sense, you know, there are certainly mothers who, who are mothers for, this, for their own sake because they want to have a child, you know, because that, that their identity gets wrapped up in them. But in the purest sense, they're bringing a, a life into the world. And uh, they're carrying that, they're making sacrifices, then they teach the child uh, how to behave, they take care of the child. And the mother sacrifices, you know, what may be her um, things that she wanted to do in life. Maybe she wanted to finish school, maybe she wanted a career or something like that. And she's willing to do all those things in the purest sense. So that goes to what you were just saying, you know, your ego was catching up with you and saying, oh, I want to do all these things. But then your wisdom was catching up with you and saying, oh, here's my ego talking. You know, I should be doing this for the benefit of my niece. But that's that's the right answer, though, from a spiritual angle. That is the correct answer. I should just do it and, and be happy for her joy. 
right? And and rejoice in that, like that she's asking for that. And that I shouldn't, my ego was the one like, oh, Zara, you're going to be tired. Zara, you're going to be cranky. And then that, hence, but that, but the correct way is I should do the action for her because it brings her joy. Yeah, I think so. so. I mean, that's what I think this all points I'll to. be writing a text message at 9 p.m., 9.01 p.m. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so sure, to be honest. I mean, what, I, I think it's all ego on some level. I don't mean just your thing specifically, Zara, but in general with this stuff, like, we need to have boundaries with people. There's certain things. I could be like, Lance, I want you to be available to answer any question and teach me 24-7. If I want you to wake up, you have to wake up to, you know, I could, for you to be like, no, like, <laughs> we have to have certain kind of limits to what we're doing here and everything. Like, that's uh, just because it's something that I want or another person wants. I don't think it would have to be, again, this doesn't necessarily apply directly in your case, 100%, Sarah, but that, that that's ego and then not doing something is ego. To me, it's, I think there's something in terms of our own psychological and emotional and social health and well-being that requires some kind of boundaries and limitations with people as well, in the sense that it, but it's all, it's, it's, it's all ego. I mean, at least how I understand what we're meaning by when I'm thinking about ego of either way, if it's coming from this sense of a limited personal self that's separate from, from the world, looking out at the world, that's in a sense what I think, understand we mean by ego in, in the, Buddhist context that it's it's all ego in that sense. No, no. Man, do you say it would be judicious discernment in making these types of day-to-day -day decisions, these practical decisions where it's discernment, but also like, I don't know. Well, there's a certain common sense to it, you know, and there's, uh, you know, the example we always use is about, you know, being in the airplane and, and the mask comes down, you gotta, you gotta save yourself first, you gotta do something, you know, to, so in order that you can help other people, you gotta get your stability together to be able to help other people. So if in the example you were using about going to California and going to the zoo and stuff like that, if that's impinging on your stability as a, as a human being because you've got to maintain a certain stability, well, that's certainly something that has to be looked at. But if it's only, you know, a matter of convenience for yourself and there's, you know, there's no enjoyment for yourself, and you can't see the enjoyment that you're going to um, give to your to your niece and so on, and that doesn't matter to you, then that sounds to me like that would be a, an ego trip. You know, there's not enough in it for me. You know, my ego is not being stroked enough. You know, what's in it for me? Is what and you're that, thinking is what you're that, thinking instead of oh that. the pleasure that I'm helping the pleasure that I'm helping my my niece that's what's in it for me that's that to see that is that empathetic joy is what I'm I'm looking for. Matt, what were you saying? I was laughing at her nap comment um, when you asked her what's in it for her. Um, I'm gonna be in the back seat with three yeah. kids under the age of five sleeping. It's nap time, nappy nap time for the two hour ride to San Diego. <laughs> um, well, you see, you know, and that's the thing, you've got more of a choice. If, if, if you were the mother, you right. would have less of a choice, you know? It's just yeah. something that you got to do. You know, I mean, when you become a parent, you just got to say, wow, for 18 years, I just got to put my life on hold or five years or whatever it is, you know, till the kids go to school or something like that. You know, there's no greater, I, I didn't know what it was to be a mother until I became a father. And I never realized, you know, the sacrifices that we have to make and the, and the sacrifices that a mother has to make, you know, to raise a child. You don't know that until you do it. You're right. Both of you are right. Both both of you have uh, points. I think it's contextual. So it's individually contextual. Thank you. Bernie, would you like to comment on any of this? So uh, commenting on loving kindness and the development of loving kindness or the difference between uh, uh, practicing for yourself and practicing for all sentient beings. Well, any of okay. that that comes to your mind, you know. Well, 
Of course, my main practice has been Chen Rezig for many years. And uh, the focus of Chen Rezig practice is on loving kindness. So I have to say, when you do a practice like that, it tends to, uh, it works. You know, it, you practice, I'm sure if I practice Manjushri, my wisdom would increase instead of my loving kindness. But uh, it was something that, uh, what the actor Alvin Alda, I think he was in MASH for many years, said once in an interview, he said he always liked being an actor because there's always something about playing a role that sticks with you after you're finished playing the role. And I think that's what happens when you practice uh, 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 one of the Bodhisattva, one of the uh, meditations, one of the uh, deity meditations. Because you're thinking about it all that time, it tends to stick with you and it tends to model your mind. Now, as far as the importance of these practices, now, I don't think it's a good idea to put down the Hinayana so much because uh, really, you can't really say that you've overcome suffering without a without at least some sense of renunciation, some sense that uh, uh, you, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I was, thought it was my phone. It was something else. Okay. Uh, what happens is that you uh, uh, need to have some sense of uh, renunciation or you're you're kind of fooling yourself when you're saying, oh, I'm beyond selfishness and I live for the sake of others. The, the, I, I mean, it can't, I'm not saying it's perfectly, it's impossible to have it, but uh, uh, you, they're kind of opposed to each other. And the more you overcome your own uh, desires, the easier it is to, to act for the benefit of others. That should be obvious because uh, they're kind of, I mean, sometimes they are in opposition. Now, uh, so that's why we need the... Uh, Hinayana before we can move to the Mahayana, in my opinion. So, uh, as far okay, as far as the uh, danger of uh, practicing with a selfish attitude is that uh, I used to say this when I was in the uh, yoga center: the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is that you become a professional Buddhist. And what I meant by that is somebody who's who's read all the texts and uh, studied everything has become an expert. He can tell you where it says this or that in the scripture, but they've never done any application of what they've studied to their own lives. It's really necessary not just to uh, be a great student of Buddhism, because it's a difficult subject. You need to study it some. You have to apply it to your own life. And if you don't, uh, then it becomes a problem. I think that's kind of a, a different problem than the whole uh, selfishness problem. But it's something that you have to work with as well, well as the selfishness, the, the tendency just to study it and understand things on a superficial level rather than trying to apply it to your own life. Uh, is that enough? Uh, that's all I have to say for right now. So yeah, well, that's great. Thank you. You know, and I think what that speaks to is the necessary, uh, the, the the need for a structure. You know, and the Hinayana is the discipline that that begins that process of creating a structure for ourselves. You know, and that's it is. It's very important, and it, and it shouldn't be minimized no more than the foundation of the house that you live in or the uh, the high-rise building that you're going to go into and take the elevator up to the 91st floor or something like that. You want that building, you want your house to have a firm foundation. So the Hinayana is the firm foundation in the, in the Buddha uh, philosophy and practices. So it's very important. I'd like to go back to uh, something that Matt said when he was talking about ego and to look at this a little bit and matt might be a, a, a much greater expert in this at least in the western expressions of of ego and saying that everything is ego 
Um, you want to talk about that? Is that what you think, that everything is ego? Is that the way it's explained? Is that the way you see it? Oh, no, no, certainly not. Um, no, not that everything would be ego. Uh, I, I guess I just um, meant in the sense of should I be doing this one thing that would be more gratifying in the moment or should I be doing this? I guess some of it really gets down to what are, what art do we mean when we're saying ego in this context of our conversation, but that both of those are ego in a in a sense, I guess one of them is moving more towards a place of being less selfish, which is a, a reduction maybe in the how pronounced the the, the uh, feeling of being in ego is. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, rather than one of them being uh, like transcendent of the ego or uh, I guess uh, at the heart of it, what, what I'm thinking in a spiritual context, what I'm thinking of as ego is that uh, that feeling of being separate, being the, the haver of the experience, being separate from my experience, having it, sitting there directing my attention all over the place. You know, the one who's feeling the sensations, the, the one that's outside of the experience, the one that's alien to the world, walking around trying to make all of these desires and everything come true. I don't know. I'm, and honestly, I'm really, this has been a long day, so I don't know if this even makes sense. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm running on fumes, but that's some of the thoughts. Well, no, it's it's good. We're, we're, we're developing a conversation here. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, personally I've had to understand in the um, when we talk about the philosophy and everything is is the self. Right. You know, there's, you know and, and uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to become selfless mm -hmm. instead of selfish. Yeah. So the ego to me. I think is is an expression of that selfishness. Mm. Are you doing something uh, for your own sake, for your own identity, mm. your own selfish reasons? Is developing the ego and so on. Yeah, we can't we can't literally destroy the ego. You know, we have the ego. It's part of our psyche. It's part of our dualistic human nature and so on. What we're trying to do through our practices, through our Buddhist practices, through our spiritual practice, is to be able to transcend the ego, not to annihilate it, not to destroy it, but to transcend it, to go beyond that, to become selfless. And so the, the example, the best example, the perfect example of being selfless is our Buddha nature, what we call our Buddha nature, you know, so uh, we can look at it, we can look at it in different terms and so on. And, and that all becomes contextual because soon as we start thinking about other traditions and everything, it gets, you know, the context of their culture, the context of their concepts and so on like that. We could say God, but in some places, God is expressed as a wrathful being who has a certain selfishness that if you don't if you don't respect me, you don't practice me, you don't hell and damnation is going to befall you. That sounds very selfish to me, you know? And that's a bastardization of what I would consider to be the concept of of a pure spirit like Buddha or what God would be, or what Christ would be, or or uh, any other tradition we could talk about, Allah, you know, all this, you know, uh, and in case of Allah, and I can't, I'm not an expert in any of this, but, you know, many of the, the what I've heard is that the teachings of Allah are nothing but love. And all this stuff that happens, you know, with all this militant um, Islamic, you know, stuff has all been contrived over the, the, the centuries to create some kind of an ego and, a, and an identity of who these people are and that they're different than other people instead of saying we're all selfless at our root, at our essence. And that's what we need to be able to transcend our ordinariness to be able to get to. Is that somewhat accurate, Zara? 
the, the talking about you know the uh the essence of allah what allah is 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 meant to or is is expressed as in in the purest sense yeah i mean yes that's what i would i would say like and and also it's you've talked about it also because might come from a household of christianity and islam jesus the christ right um so like I, it all to me becomes the same sort of conceptual thing that in practice over time over centuries people have conceptualized it differently as an intellectual thing in order to relate to their spiritual something they don't understand but so, yeah i i yes your point yes for islam yes so and in, in, in Christianity, Judaism, and all the different traditions, um, uh, Hinduism, how many wars, how many people have been killed in the name of some kind of a spiritual religion or something like that? That, that you know, you're, you're impeding my ability to be able to practice or to live the way I want, so therefore I'm going to take your life. You know, and, and that's all very ego statistical and and saying that my way is better than your way and it's and it and it's so important that I'm willing to take the life of somebody else in order to be able to protect myself to protect my ego you know the way I look at it is we assign our ego a job you know we we look at things through uh the wisdom of discriminating awareness you know we talked about the Buddha Amitabha, the wisdom of discriminating awareness, and we're able to see all these different uh, gradations of color, and so on, and and we're able to make uh, we're able to make judgments as as bodhisattvas who have to navigate this pathway that's full of all these choices and so on, and the point of being on this pathway is to experience these choices and and ultimately make the choices that we need to and the ultimate choice is to become pure and free to not have any of this ego we're not killing the ego we're not annihilating it but we are rising above the ego the ego is something that is human Lance, I love when you say, um, I always write down like the one-liners that resonate with me. Um, one of the more recent things in the last 24 hours that you've said was we have to assign our egos a job. And so it's funny, yesterday I was dealing with just, just I call it the, 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 whatever, the crap, the crap about my personal life, just stuff that comes in and out, in and out. And I, and I said to myself, oh, my ego has to find a job. Like I literally just started saying it. I'm like calling it out inside myself. I'm like, oh, you're grasping for something to do around this drama loop. Like you can't just let it be. Like you can't just neutralize. You, you have to grasp on to be angry, be angry, be angry because you need to have an identity underneath this context. Um, but your this ego one, will take over. Yes. And that's why I just said, I used that line because you've also said things like sometimes at some points with your thought cycles, you keep having them over, you have to just say, cut it out. Like you have to tell yourself, like, just stop. And I started doing that one as well, where I caught myself in these loops that I should have already, you know, resolved. I have some of these skills, these skill sets, and, and now I'm just using some of these one liners that you drop, <laughs> just like cut it out. Uh, that's helpful, like, because at, at a point, it actually becomes way more harmful just on a personal level, but it also impedes my spiritual development, right? If I keep going in these loops past some level of initial like processing of what just happened so I can gain the wisdom and maybe make better choices in the future. Uh, now I've just started recognizing, okay, you're on the fifth week of this. Let's cut it out. Uh, this is an ego thing. This is not processing from a behavioral health standpoint. So um so thank you that that's actually helpful so now i that's another one i'm using your ego needs a job <laughs> that may be a t-shirt <laughs> no, maybe a t-shirt for me <laughs> oh. and and there are practices there are deity yoga practices in buddhism that helps us to recognize the self and see that the self is completely illusory and needs to be overcome we're not annihilating it there's some in some of the practice it may seem that that's what's 
that, that that's what it's trying to do that it's actually annihilating the self but what it's doing it's kind of nailing the the ego it's nail, na nailing the self to this all these preconceived ideas that are just empty of their own nature it's just illusory it's like a rainbow and so when we can we can study that when you nail that then we can say oh this is what i've been doing all this time and now i need to release all that i need to let all that go before we were able to nail it it was too it was too vague you know it was too abstract so these practices you know for have different activities involved in them but some of them are for this purpose to be able to recognize the self in order to let the self go to become selfless it's painful lance it's, it's become more it's funny as i've grown and maybe matt this was a little bit of what you were tapping into yesterday with that your profound question as i've gotten like i have had exponential growth now it's like oh i'm feeling the pain now as i get closer and closer to my true self where i'm like i'm about to it's like letting go i'm like still holding on by a thread like a trust fall and i'm like do i really want to let go and now i really experientially understand why people when you die like you just go back into it you just you're like i can't handle this this what this beautiful power of complete freedom is i can see it now as i'm like I'm like, oh crap! This is what this is what it's all is. This is it right now. I'm and I'm I'm like catching myself. Like I understand and I have empathy for people who continue to reborn in samsara by choice. By choice, they want to come back into it. Right. It gives them identity. Yeah. They have identity. They have they have what a power. You know, and and people will gravitate to to being the best neurotic that they can, and and allow their and allow their ego to get wrapped up in that. I wonder if each of us here could write a letter to ourselves and say, like, three generations from now, like, you can be free. Do you choose the freedom, or do you, will you be reborn? Because you just need that. I, I like. I'm just wondering it's a wonder question. Well, that's an excellent that's an excellent suggestion and and that's what a lot of writers do you know either subconsciously or consciously in particular spiritual writers people that write these prayers you know that write these these practices you know they're writing these things for their own benefit to be able to overcome the demons that are within them to so to speak you know, and, and and here is this practice for me to be able to overcome this. Here is this prayer that I'm writing that I can see myself, that I can see this difficulty. Absolutely. You know, you know that that's one of the great things about being a writer is you're you're seeing yourself. You're 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 becoming naked and you're sharing it with other people. You're sharing it with yourself. You know so that you can reveal you know these inner secrets that you've been holding on to that are feeding you know this 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 pettiness of our ego so yes that's a great suggestion writing a journal writing poetry writing short stories whatever whatever it is Alex, you're so quiet. Yeah, I was just going to ask Alex. He's with us. Uh, we can see his uh, his picture there. Alex, do you have any comments you'd like to bring up? Well, he may have stepped away from the uh, from his computer then. Okay. Well, then we'll come back to Matt because. <laughs> um, is this making sense to you, Matt? Matt, in a in a professional way. Um, can you see how 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 the the spiritual aspect of this is a is a is a connection point to the uh, psychological work that you do with with your uh, clients, your patients, whatever? Yeah, yeah, um, and I think it's um, important that we're also tending to that part of ourselves as well, the psychological, the relative, 
one thing that I think is beautiful about the Tibetan tradition is they pay a lot of attention to the relative self as in as well as the the transcendent and the um you know the non-dual um i think we can get in situations where we um uh can try to like spiritualize our ego in a way where we're, we're not actually dealing with our stuff but we trying to put i'm not saying any you know i'm saying people here in our group right now but i'm just in general that i see with people or um yeah we're yeah needing to take care of ourselves in our relative lives as well in our thought patterns and i don't it, it i have trouble really separating out the spiritual from the non-spiritual for me it, it seems it's always felt like a weird distinction to, to um i'm not even sure what we mean by spiritual when we're by that word i mean i use the word and everything but um um uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's all playing at the same dance in some ways, but I, I think the, the Western psychological tradition and certainly like the psychotherapeutic tradition, I, I don't um, I, I don't think it has the kind of depth and prof profundity that the that the Buddhist tradition has, which is why why you see me here tonight on on a on a on a Monday evening. But I, I do think at times with the, something like the Buddhist tradition where there's also its own blind spots, particularly around things related to relationships, um, some other kind of psychological things that aren't um, as well. So I think they can be wedded nicely in certain ways. Well, I think you're right, you know, about the point of the spiritual and the non-spiritual or the psychological, whatever you want to call it, intellectual or something like that. And in the beginning of my learning about, you know, the you know, the, the philosophy and so on. Um, I kind of struggled with that. And, um, you know, and I began to think of it, you know, my teacher, Jupan Ningpo, you know, he nailed it for me when he said, look, this is the little mind and this is the big mind, mm -hmm. you know, but they're both mine. This mind here has the ability to block up this big mind. How does it do that? because the big mind is very, very, very subtle. It's very easy to put on the side. The little mind has a very big mouth. It's very loud. He will dominate anything, anytime, anywhere. And you get a bunch of egocentric people in a room together, and you know what craziness it is. <clears throat> you get a bunch of spiritualists in a room, and it's hard to to get a conversation going because everybody is being transcendent and so on. Yeah, you know. So, um, but the point is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring a intellectualization. We're trying to bring an understanding to uh, to our spirituality to be able to validate it. And to be able to say it is something that is beyond our intellectual capability to be able to really um, articulate, to express. But yet it, it's there. You know, that spirituality is there. As human beings, we've reached that ceiling. We've reached that level of being able to say, can I accept this which I don't totally comprehend? and be able to abide in that. Lance, so, may I add something? Oh, yes, Alex, you're with us. Maybe. Yeah, uh, I I was with you. I was just a bit hypnotized by your voice. <laughs> I see, OK. Well, so. But I thought I, I, I heard all, what everybody is, is saying. And uh, my take on ego is uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the car that you bought for yourself or the like really nice clothes that, that you picked at a really nice store. Um, it, it, it kind of, uh, I mean, there is reason to be attached to and uh, uh, there is reasons why it is as it is. Uh, and there are reasons to miss it sometimes. But, for example, when, when we need to really go a good distance, 
we leave our car at home and we jump on the airplane and we're happy to get, you know, where we need to be. So if 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 that is nice, shiny car, beautiful color that we love, you know, is not with us on the trip, you know, who cares? Uh, if it doesn't get us, you know, far, if, if it breaks along the way, if it gives trouble. Um, so, and uh, at the same time, uh, we, we can always... Um, improve our car <laughs> we, we can always work on it and and like uh, uh we start with a tricycle maybe in our childhood and then you know by the time we get you know to our retirement we have some you know really fancy thing um so i mean we hardly recognize you know, uh, what our ego is, you know, after a few years. So, I mean, we, um, and then we need to go beyond. So it, it's like a clothes that, that, you know, some clothes are good for certain occasions. Some clothes are good for every day, but, um, I mean, no clothes is really good when you want to swim in the ocean. <laughs> so. so it's like an identity, you know. It's a, you know, it's just a a way of identifying ourselves, you know, to to ourselves, and and for the benefit of other or for the sake of other beings that they may look at us and in this way and say, "Oh, he drives that car. Oh, he wears those clothes. Oh, he's very successful, or he does these things, or." whatever it becomes part of our identity but it's 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 it is a temporary identity yeah yeah and uh in the next live we'll have totally different personality so um it's uh it it, it yeah i think it's uh something that we can work on but not really need to have attachment i mean and uh, you can you can have several identities. Some people have several identities. <laughs> yes, that's right. And and and, and they happy <laughs> uh, to to have that. I mean, that's true. If if you if you're an artist, if you're not like my my grandmother was uh, well artist in a way that uh, um, you know playing in theater. She was actor actor. So. I mean, actors wear these identities depending on what what play they're in, and uh, and they will not uh, be able to shed them off, you know, every day. You know, they have to stay in them during during uh, you know everyday life, and people like wondering what have happened to them. No, <laughs> no they just. Uh, they're just taking it on, and then they be, there'll be something else, you know, later. Yeah, and that can be very mundane things, but it also could be very great things. And Bernie was was he talked about that when he was talking about when we do the deity yoga practices, the different practices that we're we're imagining ourselves as becoming these great deities, these perfectly realized deities who have a particular activity that we're trying to emulate to bring into our into our into our consciousness into our lives and to help guide us to a to a higher level of that which we had left wanted to leave behind so that's one of the purposes it's like a role play you know that's what the yeah. deity yoga is about and the mantra is basically saying, well, here's my name and here's the work I do. And this is my mantra. This is how I repeat this. So, and that's a, and that becomes, you know, a protection for us of our purity because this is saying my mundane nature is full of confusion, is full of afflictions, full of contaminations and corruptions. But these deities here, are perfectly realized beings, and this is what I'm aspiring to be. This is what it is to be a complete human being that is 
able to transcend this samsaric life. Yeah, and it's like, uh, um, I don't know, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's like trying a new role. And um, when, when, uh, when you tried it enough, uh, you suddenly don't have to pretend, you know, something, but uh, you actually acquire those qualities. You become the embodiment of those qualities. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happens, yeah. you know, that's what happens to bad guys too, bad people, you know, as children, as infants, you know, everybody's the same, everybody's innocent and et cetera, you know, but through uh, the role play, they take on negativity and they become good at the negativity and then it becomes, they become the embodiment of that negativity. And for them to break that, that habit, you know, of being a, a bad guy is serious business. You know, it, it, you know, do they have to be separated? Do they have to be incarcerated? Do they have to go through different kinds of therapies to help them to to break that that addiction that they have to the negativity that they've been using as a, as a criminal or something, or that we use as being a neurotic or being an egotistical person? You know, so it's all a matter of degrees, isn't it? Well, let me continue. So going back to the book here, going back to the outline, and on page 11, uh, then we have the four points of the, the method of loving kindness practice, which we touched on when we were talking with, with Zara and talking about the four kindnesses of the mother. You know, so so this is how we can, here's a very simple way to be able to ground ourselves in what loving kindness is. Not getting so fancy, not getting too, you know, elaborate, very simple. Look at it through being the mother and going through the sacrifices, etc., that a mother goes through to have a child and raise a child or and a family and so on. So here it's very simply expressed. So then the next point here is the measure of the practice of loving kindness. How do we say that we are acting with a higher degree of loving kindness? So here it's spelled out for us. This is the beauty of the dual ornamental liberation. It tells us so much stuff. It is a priceless piece of work for us to be able to have as a blessing and study and understand who we are. It says here, when one does not desire happiness for oneself, but only for other sentient beings, that is the perfection of the practice of loving kindness. So whatever you're involved in, if you can take a minute or two or three or four or five or a meditation or whatever, and you say, what am I doing? How selfish am I in what I'm doing? Am I doing this completely for myself or am I doing this for the benefit of others? And be as honest as you can. And you may hide from that. You may, you may want to change the subject real quick. Your leg may start hurting. Your leg falls asleep. You know, you start getting back pain. You start thinking about, oh, man, I forgot I got to go call somebody. Let me stop my meditation. Let me stop this folly, this foolishness of thinking about this. Let me go call somebody. Oh, there's a television program I wanted to watch. Rather than facing the reality of what is it that we are doing? to ourselves, and then indirectly, or directly, however you want to express it, to other people. You know, so, so by saying, how selfish am I? And how selfless am I? You know, am I willing to uh, spend um, two hours talking about these things 
with my friends? And am I willing to spend the whole six hours before that in preparation of having this conversation? How willing am I to, to read this before I enter into the conversation, rather as the, the leader of the conversation or one of the people that's involved in the conversation? Now, I know there's all kinds of mitigating circumstances that, you know, interfere with our best aspirations. I certainly understand that. But let's be honest about what they are and what we're doing. You know, and even if it's at a time of our lives where, you know, right now we got to be concentrating on our family, we got to be concentrating on our careers. You know, we got we got these practical things that we need to do, and I'm making time to keep my awareness, my connection with the spirituality. I'm going to do that. But I'm also thinking in the back of my mind, there's going to be a time when I'm going to be able to spend a lot more time really investigating these things. Maybe it's going to be a weekend retreat. Maybe it's going to be a week-long retreat. Maybe it's going to be when I retire, you know? So just have it in mind that we are spiritual beings and I'm trying to maintain, maintain, I'm trying to make that connection and maintain that connection through these practices, through these readings, through these contemplations, and that we need to do whatever we can to maintain that. So that's the measure of the practice of loving kindness, very simply stated. And then there's eight qualities, it says here, of the benefits of loving kindness. So I'll just read these very quickly. You know, one will be loved by the gods, one will be loved by human beings, one will be protected by human beings, one will achieve mental peace. One will achieve many happinesses. One will be uh, will not be harmed by poisons or weapons. One will achieve his or her wishes without effort. One will be reborn in the God realm. So, what does this all this mean? You need to think. You need to contemplate this. You need to maybe do a little bit of research. You need to read this. You need to look into some of the other conversations that we've had and so on. The six realms of being a human being. When we talked about that, you know, these things are being expressed in there. So, just reading this one time, just hearing this in this conversation one time, doesn't bring a high degree or any degree of enlightenment. It just maybe shows us, oh, this is where I can begin the process of really understanding, of fathoming this. Does that make any sense? I'm, su I'm sure it does. I'm asking a question that I know the answer to, and I want you to know the answer to it. Let's, what, um, what do you think about, uh, the idea of um, kind of leading the change through behavior. And this is something that I always like about how, how you are uh, talk about your practice. Um, and so leading through behavior, what I mean by that in the sense of um, starting with the pushing ourselves to be doing the things, to be going out and doing these things for people, uh, these kind of bodhisattva type of activities. It's like, okay, my it's going to be very hard for me to, uh, not that you shouldn't do this as well, but like meditate this uh, perfect motivation into myself or perfect love, but like through the going out and just like getting ourselves to keep pushing ourselves to doing things, do this thing for this person, do this nice thing for this person, go volunteer, do something almost like, almost like a like karma yoga and like the Hindu tradition, I think is something kind of similar to that. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that as part of the path or how that could help develop the loving kindness, like through the behavior itself. Oh, absolutely. But we gotta have a we gotta have an understanding of what the motivation is. We gotta we gotta understand, you know, the 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 structure of what that is. 
So yeah. that's what we're trying to do here. But yes, <laughs> ultimately, that's what it is, isn't it? Going out and taking your place in society. And and I'm glad you said that, because now that brings something to point, to my, my, my mind. In the Hinayana, the hero of the Hinayana is the Arhat. And the Arhat is a holy being, a very religious being, very dedicated, very committed being, who selfishly is going off by themselves into their hermitage, whatever it might be, a cave, sitting underneath of a tree, building a house and living by themselves or whatever, and doing that for what might be the rest of their lives. And they will become a great arhat. They might write great things, and they might make these things available to other beings, you know, in the monastery or whatever. And they're great things. But it's a selfish thing. It's selfishly motivated for their own liberation. In the Bodhisattva tradition, in the Mahayana tradition, the middle way tradition, it's for the benefit of others. The hero of the Mahayana is the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva may go off up into the hills, may go to the monastery, may go to the, to the cave, may go to the hermitage for maybe a, a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe five years. But then comes out of that and goes down into the village and begins to interact with the other ordinary people and is teaching them the things that they learn, sharing with them their experiences of being up in the hermitage. And they do that for some time. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, whatever. But then the experiences that that Bodhisattva has accumulated is going to be a mixture of, of perfections and failures. And they recognize that. And then they go back up into the hills again. They go back up into the hermitage. And they work on those imperfections. Maybe the imperfection is the imperfection of spiritual, um, <clears throat> excuse me, spiritual pride. You know, they go down and and oh, here I am. I've been up in the mon I've been up in the, the the hermitage for five years, and I'm so great. I'm going to share this with you. And finally, they realize that their ego has taken over, and they think that they're better than everybody else. And they have to purify that. They go back up into the into the hills, or maybe it's their ignorance. Maybe they don't realize something or they learn something there and they need to perfect that and so on. And they go and do that and then they come back down into the village and then they spend time, they go back up and everything. So there's this process of the bodhisattva of who is purifying themselves over and over again through going up and being alone and then sometimes coming down and being with ordinary beings and working with ordinary beings. So that's a, a huge difference between the hero of the Hinayana and the hero of the, of the um, Bodhisattva. They're both necessary. You know, for the Bodhisattva to get to be the Bodhisattva had to be the Arhat. So we went through and I got a picture where I gave everybody a picture. Uh, I can't find it in the stack of papers I got right here. Well, remember that picture I gave everybody and it had the great big, you know, buddy Sattva and he was tempering the metal. Remember that? Mm. Mm. Remember that illustration? 
I, can, I know I got it here. I just have to find it. If I saw that ever, I, I actually don't remember, but that's a good analogy. But he's he's yeah, taking like he's taking the ore out of the earth. That's it. And the thing is, I think for it to come up. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, you probably won't get six. I have this. I don't know. My the he's way my taking, zoom is. Yeah. He's taking the ore out of the ground, the 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 the, the um, iron, and the iron is very brittle. You know, you can break it with your with your hands if it's thin enough. You know, you can break it, you can smash it, you can break it apart pretty easy. And that's like our mind. That's like us, you know, ordinary human beings. But he takes the ore and he puts it into a, a hot fire until it glows red and then gets to be white. And he's burning away all the, the negativity and so on like that. He's burning it away. It's like the wisdom fire. And then he takes it out of the fire and he puts it onto the anvil like a blacksmith. And he takes a big hammer and he starts beating the metal. And sparks are flying. And the sparks that are flying are all the impurities that are in the iron. Because it's not pure iron. It's got other junk in there. And he's beating it and it's and it's and and the iron is getting thinner and thinner. And then he takes the iron out and he puts it in the cold water. And the steam comes up. And then he takes it out of the water again, puts it in the hot fire again, gets it white hot, takes it out, puts it on the anvil, starts beating it again, and then it gets even more thinner. And then he takes it and puts it in the water and he keeps doing this process. And what he's able to do is at the end of this, he's able to take that metal, same metal, but it's pure. And he's able to bend it. It becomes resilient. Instead of breaking, instead of our mind breaking, instead of our body breaking, instead of our spirit breaking, it becomes pliable. And this is the tempering process. This is what we're doing. This is what the Bodhisattva does. So it's the wisdom is the hot fire. The cooling is the compassion. The water is symbolic of the compassion. And it cools it down. And all the molecules, the electrons and everything start lining up and everything. And, and then he does the process. So it's the process of the wisdom fire, which is loving kindness, and the cooling compassion, which is the water. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, this is overcoming. This is the antidote to the attachment to the pleasure of peace. We thought the peace was just having this iron. Oh, I got this iron. This is wonderful. I got this gold. I got this silver. You know, but what can you do with it? So then. The next part of this conversation is to go to the is to go to the excuse me the compassion part. So it says when loving kindness is perfected, when the loving kindness is perfected in the way that we've been talking about, then the practice of compassion becomes easy, becomes not difficult. Compassion is the other side of wisdom. Loving kindness is wisdom. Compassion is the wisdom, applying the wisdom with method. Mm. The wisdom is not any good unless you can actualize it, unless you have a method in being able to do something with it. So that's the compassion. If I have all this knowledge and I don't help anybody, what did I do? You know, was it was it worthwhile? Was it was it important? Was it loving kindness? Or was it just a selfishness? Or do I show the compassion that I'm going to find ways to be able to talk to people about this 
and take the time to develop that and so on, is that not the compassion of the wisdom, the method of the wisdom? Is that not what you do in your jobs every day? Okay, so uh, uh, it helps me understand that like loving kindness is, is more is something that you uh, experience inside yourself and compassion is more something that you kind of project onto the world, onto others. Yeah, in a very simple way, yes. That's a very good way of expressing it, yes. Yes. And um, yeah, so. So the wisdom is like your the wisdom is like your database. Yeah. Your 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 wisdom is like your database, and then what do you do with the database? Yeah, you, you make searches and find out <laughs> who yeah. you're gonna help next. <laughs> you sell it to Amazon. <laughs> So the compassion, so now going back to the next page of this book, the compassion is a mind that wants all sentient beings to separate from suffering and its cause. What is that compassion? Why does that arhat, who's been up in the, up in the um, uh, cave for five years, why does it want to come out of the cave and go down and help other beings? Because he realizes, I can't be happy if those people are suffering. Mm -hmm. How can I possibly be happy? How can I be liberated? How can I be that selfish when those people are suffering so miserably? And maybe I can do something to help them, to help themselves. I can't, I can't take away their, their suffering, but I can show them what I discovered for myself, the wisdom, to be able to liberate myself from that suffering. That's what I can do. So that's what the Arhat comes to that realization. It says, I got to go and I got to go and help other people. I can't keep it myself. And that's the hallmark. That's when, that's when the, the Hinayana becomes the Mahayana for the benefit of others. So then it goes on, you know, some more detail here, you can read it, but, you know, compassion with sentient beings as its object, seeing the suffering beings in the lower realms, compassion with phenomena as its object, the well-trained in the practice of the Four Noble Truths, understanding cause and result, understands impermanence for oneself and the confusion of others who do not understand. These are things that we've been talking about, you know, in weeks, weeks, months, past years, and so on. This is what we talk about in, in our 101 classes. And then the non-objectified compassion of the Buddha, the one who is established in equipoise and realizes all phenomena as the nature of emptiness and realizes that all phenomena as the nature of emptiness. This is the nature, this is the display of the equipoise, the display of the, the, the Buddha nature, the Buddha mind, the awakened mind, who realizes all this and doesn't mind being interrupted to be able to come to the benefit of all other beings. It's not a selfishness, you know, but will remain quiet and will remain in that samadhi. And when it's interrupted, when that samadhi is interrupted, okay, what can I help you do? What can I help you talk about? So it's in here to read. It's it's in here to read. 
So the method of the compassion practice, the method of the compassion practice, if you remember, is to consider all beings as your mother suffering in the six realms of samsara. We talked about that when we talked about the six human realms. We talked about that as the stages of meditation. That you, I gave you a whole cheat sheet on how to do practice. So we go through the process of considering the four kindnesses of the mother. Then we go to compassion and we think about our mother being in the six realms of samsara. What would we do if our mother was in the hell realm? How would we help our mother? How would we help her if she was a hungry ghost, if she was greedy? How would we help her if she was an animal and ignorant? How would we help her if she was caught in the desire of being a human being? Or what we would do for her if she was arrogant and caught up in being a... Um, uh, a, a god or a demigod in in the conflict, constantly causing conflict, constantly dividing people and um, creating conflict in people's minds and, and lives and so on. What would we do to help our mother? Are there any limits to what we would do to help our mother? We would say, oh, mom, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Thanks. Thanks for giving me a life, but I can't help you. Can we, can we take that and apply that to all beings? Now, of course, there's common sense stuff that comes up with that kind of a statement, you know? You can't walk up to people and shake them and say, oh, don't you understand? But people that come to you who are looking for guidance, people in your sphere of influence and so on, those people... And, and this was to Matt's point, I think, was, you know, how do you uh, show them, you know, your accomplishment? What behavior do you have that connotes to them what you've been able to cultivate, what you've been able to develop and so on? So why would compassion not arise if we saw our mother in those situations, in those six realms? So meditate on a compassionate desire, a compassionate desire or an aspiration to free such beings from their sufferings. I like to use the word aspire rather than desire. Desire always has a, a, a passionate aspect to it, a lustful ac uh, aspect to it desire uh, in this case when it's a higher a higher purpose desire i think of it as an aspiration so this buddha compassion this buddhist compassion does not make samsara go away it does not make it better but it does help to get rid of samsara unconditional, non-judgmental forgiveness. That's how we deal with it. We endure. We endure through loving kindness. We endure through helping other beings. We endure through the joy. We endure through the equanimity. In other words, the bodhicitta, the holy enlightened mind. That's this. And when this mind and this mind come together, then that's what we're looking for. That's, that's when we become a complete human being. When this, and this is when we then can assign our ego a job that makes sense. You know, not something that's beyond its capabilities, but something that is an unobtainable goal. Well, I'm, I'd like to be a neurosurgeon, I really would. I'd love to be a neurosurgeon, but I don't have the skills for that. I don't have the ability to do that. But maybe there's something else I can do that can help people in a very profound way that may change their whole psyche, their character, their, their way of being. 
So I'm assigning my ego that kind of a job. So what's the measure of the compassionate practice? How do we know that this is working? We know this is working when one has fully purified self-cherishing. If I'm self-cherishing, if I'm only thinking of myself, that's self-cherishing. Oh, I only care about me. If one has fully purified that self-cherishing and I'm not doing it anymore, is fully released or cut from the chain of self-cherishing, when from the depths of the mind one desires all sentient beings to be free from suffering, then one has perfected the practice of compassion. Now, I already said, and the Buddha has said, it's not that I said it, you know, but I just am repeating it, but we can't change samsara for everybody. We can only change it for ourselves. And we can help other people to change it for themselves. This is what we can do. So we're not going to change all of this. It's not all of a sudden going to come perfect. you know. And maybe that's what the dimensions are all about. We talk about dimension. We're three-dimensional beings. But maybe there's four dimensions. Maybe there's five dimensions, six dimensions. Maybe there's 16 dimensions. Maybe they're here right now. We just don't recognize them. But as long as we're holding on to the self-cherishing three-dimensional life, you're going to miss everything else that may be possible around here. We're just consumed with this movie. There can be all kinds of stuff around us, but we're not paying attention. I'm only watching this one movie. Yeah, movies are usually two-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> and life is three-dimensional. Life is four-dimensional. <laughs> See, he's a scientist, you know. <laughs> So then we can learn, you know, we can read this and see the qualities of compassion. What is the, the qualities of compassion? That when through loving kindness, one wants all beings to achieve happiness. That we really want this. We want all beings to be happy. We really, we're devoted to that. That's what we want. And through the compassion, one wants all beings to be free from suffering. We really do. Wouldn't it be magnificent if everybody was free from suffering? What a great place this would be. No conflicts and everything. But then we start arguing about, well, what does that mean? You know, who gets to decide what's, what's, conflict, uh, what, what, what's the right side of the conflict? But if there's no conflict, I mean, that's what the non-dual stuff is. That's what the un non-conceptual, unelaborated stuff is. The absolute wisdom, the absolute reality. The absolute truth is beyond all that, all those possibilities that we experience as three-dimensional human beings. But we want, we want that purity for all beings to, to be in that, that pure state of being beyond all of that. When one is no longer interested in achieving one's own peace and happiness, when, we're, when we give up that, our attachment to our own peace and say, whatever I can do for somebody else, that, that's what gives me happiness. That's what gives me peace. Because if I can't do it, I feel terrible. I, I don't feel good. I feel like I let somebody down. Then one is delighted to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. This becomes the remedy to attachment to the pleasure of peace that the peace comes in the doing, the behavior, the embodiment of this loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, this bodhicitta. is everything that we're doing bodhicitta. So therefore, by developing loving kindness, wisdom, and compassion, 
the method of the wisdom in the mind, in this mind, this mind coming together, one cherishes others more than oneself. This is this is how we purify. This is how we keep ourselves from egotistical thoughts. We consider other beings more important than ourselves. We hear this in, on television every day. You know, if you're watching the news and everything, you know, oh, I'm thinking about the Americans. I'm doing this for the Americans. How much of you think that that's true? Career politicians who only have one thing in mind. Don't don't be fooled. <laughs> How dare you? They're all Buddhas. How dare you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> they got the potential, but they certainly aren't living I up to it. Yeah, they got a few lives to go. No. So, this is a meditation. This is a contemplation. This is something you take with you when you get up off the cushion. Okay, so thank you for listening to my rant on this. <laughs> um, uh, Lance, could you um, uh, could you uh, help me with with the text? I was trying to uh, search if I had the text downloaded. Um, is it available as PDF somewhere? Because I, I I'm not. What text? Not sure this. I actually, uh, do, um, the Jewel Ornament, Ornament Liberation? Ornament. The Jewel Ornament Liberation? Yeah. No, you got to oh, buy the book. Yeah, you got to buy the book. I don't know if it's in a PDF form. Oh, okay, okay. There's like a, a Kindle version if you want. I think I might have that. If you oh, want. there might be that, yes. There might be a Kindle version or not something. A, not a PDF, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do have a Kindle, so I... I don't have it with me, but m maybe that's why I downloaded it. So I'll check on it. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Uh, you can still get a copy. You may have to get a used copy. I don't know if it's going back into print or not. You know, but uh, you know, from time to time, uh, the book I got was the first printing. How, how big is the book? How many pages? Oh. It's about uh, almost three inches thick, 476 pages. Oh, okay. Is, is it with commentaries? Uh, yes. Uh, the book is a commentary. It's basically a commentary, but by Gampopa. And Kenshin right. Rinpoche, in the introduction, gives his commentary on each chapter. But he has said that, that his translation is a page by page line by line word by word translation of the original text by gampopa all right and gampopa is commenting on some other text where well, he assembled all the oral teachings okay so there's lots of attributions in here that you know this teacher said this, this teacher said that, you know, to support all these things. But but it is, um, but by Kenshin's word, all this is the original, the, 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 the uh, English translation of the, uh, of Gampopa's uh, bringing this together. Milarepa requested Gampopa to do this because at the time there were all these teachers going around Tibet teaching and they didn't have books and they were teaching orally. So Melarepa wanted all this to be condensed in one book called the um, Stages of the Path. And that's what this mm -hmm. is. All right. And Gampopo was like a scholar that learned from Melarepa. He was, he was his, his Dharma, Dharma son. He was his Dharma. You know, he, he, was, uh, he had been a physician, a doctor. Yeah, and, doctor. Uh, so he's very long. And so he was very intelligent, was able to do all these things. 
Yeah, I think I, I, I remember that part. Okay, thanks. So, so Milarepa was a great yogi. He wasn't necessarily a great scholar. But he, he understood the value of scholarship and requested Gampopa to create this book, which then became, you know, a, a, a cornerstone of the Kagyu tradition. And uh, even, I, 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 I'm not much of a scholar to be able to say, but maybe even in the uh, Nyingma tradition, he helped the Nyingma tradition tr tremendously too by inspiring the words of my perfect teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nima tradition is also very scholarly in, in its approach. Well, but it's also very um, uh, um, practice oriented. Yeah, yes, yeah, both, yes. So I hope that helps. You want me to send you, you a link? You want me to see if I can find a link to the book and you can uh, I'll send it to you. Um, I, I, I remember searching it on my Kindle. So I I just, I'm not sure if I actually downloaded it, but it was not on my, on my computer or on my cloud okay. storage. So right. yeah. Right. Does anybody okay. else have any other points you'd like to raise? Any questions you'd like to bring up? Was this helpful? Yeah. I apologize. I know it starts off a little dry, you know, um, you know, and but after we get going a little bit, it starts getting more moist. It gets moistened with the the the, the blessings of Gampopa and Milarepa. I just appreciated all the conversation and um, just all the organic flow of even your insight, Lance, like as you just talk as you would without a script, um, things come together for me more and more. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Well, then thank you very much. Uh, next week, we will continue and go to page eight, or rather uh, chapter eight, and we'll talk about refuge, taking refuge, and the precepts. So uh, I think it would be helpful that we will um, read the passages that are in the book of what the refuge ceremony is, because it is a huge part of accepting you know the buddha the dharma and the sangha that we're taking refuge in the buddha dharma and sangha so it is a, a very strong mindfulness practice that we do and becomes the basis of all the other different practices every empowerment that we take to uh, do the deity yoga has a refuge built into it that we take the refuge over and over again so we'll explain more about that next time okay czar would you uh do the dedication please I certainly will um so just english you don't have to do the tibetan you tell me to do Lord Jingan Sumgan, or do you need to, to form a prayer? Um, do, do the uh, uh, lineage dedication prayer on page 18. No, so okay. continue, continue through that through page 20. Just through 20, okay. Dedication pray, prayer, it's lineage dedication prayer. Dorje, Cheng, Chen, Tila, Na, Rodong. Marpa, Mila Chochi, Gam Popa. Oh, just Bakke. do the English. Just do oh, the English. Dorje Chang, Tulopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Dharma Lord Gam Popa, Fagma Drupa, Lord Jung Kungpa. Please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessings of all the Kagyu Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all knowing state, and may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Across the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies.
confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where does unborn may it arise? Where does born may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher? I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior, realized the ultimate state, and as did Samadhavadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merit for all sentient beings. By the blessings of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging order, Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible song order, may the merit I share bear fruit. The karma prayer. Back. By the virtues collected three times by myself and all beings in the samsara and nirvana, and by the innate root of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unto past perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Drunkhong Pa Ratna Sri, who is omniscient Lord of the Dharma, Master of Interdependence, continue to increase your study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Om, Pa, uh, Om. Om. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable from the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened beings for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you at home, people uh, on YouTube. Thank you. If you have any questions, you know how to get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. <clears throat> Thank you.